Okay, welcome back to Social Psychology. Today we are talking about social influence and social change. One of, I think, the most interesting topics uh, that we will cover during the course of this lecture. Who has not heard about the Milgram obedience studies yet? Who has never heard about Stanley Milgram and the obedience studies at Yale University in the 1960s. All the others know about Stanley Milgram, obedience, obedience to authority, or the shock machine. Haben Sie davon schon mal gehört? Das ist gut. So last week we talked about and the week before last about attitudes and last week we talked about how we can change people's attitudes and of course social influence is one way to affect people's attitudes and also their behaviors and we will cover a lot of material today we will talk about the obedience studies of Stanley Milgram we will talk about majority influence but we will also be talking about minority influence and I will show you a lot of the classic studies that have been done in social psychology over the last 70 years or so first about the multiple choice questions from last week and I would kindly kindly ask you the students uh, enrolled in this course to participate this week I think the uh, the answers that I give you are based on about 40 students who have participated in the online assessments so I would be happy if more students use this to experiment with the questions and get to know what they know and what they didn't know or don't know the third person effect refers to the idea that we believe we are much less influenced by persuasive messages than most other people Three elements in a source message target communication chain. Most recently researched message factor in communication studies. Or the third of three tactics used by the third man in the film, The Third Man. And A is correct. And so I thought 74% of those who participated are uh, the idea that we believe we are much less influenced by persuasion than most other people. So typically we think, oh, that's a good advertisement in the, on television. I obviously, I'm immune against the persuasive attempt. I will not buy the product, but it's made pretty well. And I think most of the other people around me will fall into the trap and buy the product. In cases where the argument in a message is very different to what an individual believes, persuasion will be more likely if the argument is weak, the issue is ego-involving, the source is credible, or none of the above. Was denken Sie? The source is credible, correct. Of course, when the message or when, when the argument in a message is very different to what I initially think, when it's opposed to my initial opinion or contrary to my initial opinion, then when the argument is weak, I will immediately spot this and will be less likely persuaded. When it's ego-involving, when it's important to me, I will be more motivated to pursue the central route of persuasion that we have discussed last week. But when the source is credible, and I showed you a couple of uh, examples from the research, when the source is credible or likable, when it's a trusted expert, then this has the greatest impact. And 81% got this one right. The two major models of persuasion, the heuristic systematic model and the ELM, elaboration likelihood model of communication, have something in common. They both draw on processes derived from developmental theories. They deal with persuasion cues. They postulate more than two processes involved in persuasion, or they use a stage model of attitude change. This one, many people did not get right. What do you think is the correct answer? 
do these tools. <laughs> what? B? B is correct, deal with persuasion cues. And more specifically, both theories argue that when we are motivated and able to process the information via the central route in the elaboration likelihood model or on a systematic way in the heuristic systematic model, <coughs> then we process the arguments and we easily detect whether the arguments are strong or weak. But when we are neither able nor motivated to do a systematic uh, information elaboration, then we heuristically process via the peripheral route and we use all sorts of persuasion cues such as the atmosphere, the uh, colors, uh, likability of the source, etc., etc. Any questions to the elaboration likelihood model or to this question in particular? I was a little bit surprised why so many uh, have chosen the incorrect answer. I think it uh, should be fairly obvious. Okay, finally, Cindy has been pestering her parents for a week to be allowed to go to her best friend's school ball. Although she has been persistent, she is not too dismayed about her parents' refusal. What she really wanted is to go to the movies with her new boyfriend. Cindy has used a tactic known as foot in the door, foot in the mouth, door in the face, or door in the mouth. <laughs> See that? Yeah. Hey, foot in the door technique. Did anyone try one of the um, tactics? Sorry? Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I was a little bit uh, confused. Um, obviously, when we start off with a large request and the person refuses the request, this person will in some sort feel bad or guilty and therefore will probably agree to the next smaller request. So we start with slamming the door in someone's face, make a big request, this person refuses the request, and this makes him or her more likely to agree to the smaller requests that we initially had in mind. Foot in the door would be the other way around. Foot in the door would be we start off with a small request. This gives the person agreeing to this request the impression that he or she is a helpful, nice, kind, etc. person and therefore to not disturb this self-image, this positive self-view, the person is also more likely to agree to the next slightly or somewhat stronger request. So door in the face here is correct. Sorry. <laughs> okay, last week in the forum we posted the question that uh, in which ways do people deal with cognitive dissonance? How is it, for example, that some people can continue smoking uh, when they know that it is bad for their health? And again, not too many people participated in the online discussion, but here's a typical answer of the, the few that we got. There's a very well-known cognitive bias, this person says, which is called the confirmation bias, which I think is a form of cognitive dissonance. And I think other cognitive biases m might be forms of cognitive dissonance as well. This is true, the person is absolutely true, and what he says, or she says, is I think that people will actually engage in an active search of information that will support their attitude change or maintaining their original attitude. For example, a heavy smoker who can't quit, a single study stating that the relationship between smoking and lung cancer is doubtful would be much more valid than the myriad studies that show the opposite. 
I think this is in, in the end a form of cognitive dissonance. And this person is right, cognitive dissonance theory has explicitly dealt with the selective information retrieval and, and processing as one form to reduce our cognitive dissonance or to uh, avoid cognitive dissonance in the first place. Okay? So, terms. One question I would like to uh, have your opinion on, and I will reveal the answer later on. When we talk about persuasion, when we talk about social influence in general, who do you think conforms more to requests by other people, men or women? Who is more easily convinced or persuaded or agrees to small or large requests by others? Would you think it's more women or men? Who thinks men are more easily persuaded? And who thinks women are more easily persuaded? Okay, that's a slight majority, but the vast majority doesn't have any opinion. <laughs> so today, in general, we will be talking about forms of social influence. We talk about obedience to authority. We talk a little bit about power. We talk about compliance with requests, but also internalized conformity to group norms. And then towards the end of the lecture, we talk about minority group influence. Social influence can produce surface compliance, obedience to commands, and internalized conformity. That's three different things. Surface compliance, obedience, or internalized conformity. People tend to be more readily influenced by reference groups because they are psychologically significant for our attitudes and behaviors than by our membership groups. So if it just happens that you are a member of the group of blonde-haired people, or people wearing eyeglasses, or people being in class, whatever it is, 11C or E5, this is just a membership group. And it's not necessarily a group that is important to you. It does not necessarily mean that you agree to the group's standards and norms, and that these in any way influence your attitudes and behaviors. You are more easily influenced by reference groups, sometimes even groups we are not members of. A group of people in our class or cohort that we look up to, that we think they are cool people. And if these people say that we should start or stop smoking, then maybe these are much more influential. And by and large, we can distinguish two forms of influence, informational and normative. The change in opinions that occurs as a result of our desire for accurate knowledge is known as informational conformity. So our desire is that we have an accurate knowledge of the things that are going on around us, and therefore we are sometimes influenced by new information that we receive, elaborated processing of these information, and then conforming with whatever is requested or required of us. This is called informational conformity. And the result of informational influence is private acceptance. So we really think that this is true or necessary, helpful, etc. Or a real change in the opinions in the part of the on the part of the individual. On the other hand, normative conformity occurs when we express opinions or behave in ways that help us to be accepted or keep us from being isolated or rejected by our groups. And this leads to public compliance. This involves a change in behavior that is not accompanied by an actual change in one's private opinion. Think about examples in your own life. Think about things that you have said or where you have changed your attitudes. Isn't it more likely that you really change your attitudes 
if you receive information that makes you understand that your previous, your past behavior was not correct or that your past attitude was doubtful and then you receive information and afterwards you are truly convinced that your new attitude, your new opinion is a more correct one and right one and you promise yourself to live up to the new standards you have learned. And on the other hand, there are situations where some people in our group say that we should all go party tonight and you really know that you should better study because there's an exam the next morning. And you say, yes, 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 it would be good to party tonight. And you may also be a participant in this party, but your inner attitude is not in line with these requests from the majority or from the people that are important to you. You just say yes, 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 but you don't change your true attitude and you would not change your real behavior. Now look at this sentence. Given the right circumstances, we all have the potential to obey commands blindly, even if the consequences of such obedience include harm to others. This is a very strong sentence, a very strong statement. We all have the potential to obey commands blindly, even if we know that we do harm to others. And I will show you Stanley Milgram's studies in a moment. Um, and Stanley Milgram has done some variations of his experiments and from other research we know that whether we obey or not is affected by the proximity of the authority, by the leg legitimacy of the authority, by the proximity of the victim and by the degree of social support for obedience or disobedience. But think about this sentence. We all, that means me and you and the people sitting right and next to you, we all are able and sometimes follow commands of authorities blindly even if we know that it does harm to others. Stanley Milgram uh, lived from 1933 to 1984. And in the early 1960s, he did, did his famous studies on obedience to authority at Yale University. Um, that was at the time when uh, Eichmann uh, was captured by the Israelis and was put on trial in uh, Jerusalem, I think. Um, and Hannah Arendt wrote a book about the Eichmann trials, uh, which was called The Banality of Evil. And Eichmann was arguing or pledging that he was only following commands. He had no responsibility for the concentration camps and for the murder of millions of Jews. He was only doing what was expected of him as a small part, a small wheel in a big machine. And Stanley Milgram wanted to find out is there anything particular about Eichmann and, and the people who caused the Holocaust or would everyone do harmful things to others? Would everyone be able to blindly follow commands and orders even if that would involve harm to others? And he invited ordinary people into his laboratory and I will show you uh, the experiment in a moment. Um, so participants, originally I always show a slightly different video which is more a little movie and in which you see the experiment from start to the, to the end but uh, I couldn't find this video anymore on, on YouTube. I will show you a little small other video in which you can see how stressful it is for the teacher to administer electric shocks to another person, which is a learner. Uh, basically, participants came into the laboratory and then were randomly assigned to the role of either teacher or learner. And the learner, of course, was not a real participant, but he was a confederate of the experimenter. So he knew what was going on, he was always put in the role of the learner, he was 
put in front of a shock machine or was, was wired to a shock machine, but in fact this person never really received any shocks. The participant, however, truly believed that the learner was a real participant and that the assignment between learner and teacher role was indeed random. The teacher was then told that the research was looking at the effect of punishment on learning. And I think this sounds somewhat plausible. In the 1960s, when you were entering Yale University and some experimenter in a white lab coat would tell you, uh, we are studying pe people's learning behavior, and we think that if we administer some electric shocks, if we punish people for making mistakes, then this may increase their future learning. So this sounds plausible. Why not? Teachers punish you students all the time for not learning well. So there is some, uh, some uh, operant conditioning going on in many areas, in many aspects of our life. And so the teacher was encouraged to give increasingly severe electric shocks to the learner when the learner made mistakes on a, a word association task. The learner was in a different room and was in reality not receiving any shocks but pre-recorded uh, exclamations were played, such as, get me out of here, or please stop this, or my heart, my heart. <laughs> and when pushed by the experimenter to continue with the shocks, 65% of participants gave shocks up to 450 volts that were clearly labeled danger, severe shock on the shock machine. Despite getting no response from the learner for the final couple of trials. Okay, now I will show you a small, this small video that I found on YouTube. Um, Rock house. Answer. Wrong. 150 volts. Answer. Horse. Oh. Take the response. 
responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. I'm nice and slow. Well, what happened was this. Uh, Mr. Hill was trying to get a I will stop here and I encourage you to check some of the other uh, videos linked to the Milgram obedience studies and some of these studies Milgram himself is interviewed in other studies replications of these experiments are shown um, and let's go back to this one statement
given the right circumstances, we all have the potential to obey commands blindly. What were the circumstances in this experiment? Famous Yale University believed that this was an experiment that was doing something good for the, in the name of science. A serious experimenter with a white lab coat, serious procedures. Um, but these were not circumstances that you would normally expect if you ask yourself, would I go all the way to 450 volts? Would that be the circumstances that would make you obey commands blindly? Probably not. No one is holding a weapon or a gun to you and say you have to shock the other person, otherwise you would be harmed, you would be killed. It's relatively trivial circumstances that can make people blindly obeying commands, even if they are absolutely aware that they are doing harm to other people. Um, Milgram did not believe that the people that he invited into the laboratory were evil. He felt that it was a social situation and not the people themselves that was most important. It's similar as Phil Zimbardo with the famous Stanford prison experiment. And some of you may know that Philip Zimbardo has uh, uh, been um, a witness for the in favor talking in favor of the soldiers who committed the crimes in, in the Iraq war at Abu Ghraib, who were torturing and ridiculing uh, Iraq prisoners of war. You've seen the pictures, you know the stories. And Philip Zimbardo, based on his Stanford prison experiments, also argued it's not the people themselves. The people themselves are not evil. It's a situation. They are under immense pressure, immense stress. Uh, their supervisors, officers were tolerating the negative behavior. Once it started, it gets into a group norm, group feeling, and it's very difficult to get out of this. And this is what social psychologists often believe is true, but we will see that there are more recent experiments, more recent studies that also question this simple um, this simple statement. Milgram conducted multiple variations on his original procedure. I put 15, 18, 24 in question marks because it's not really clear how many variations he conducted. And there's a recent book by uh, Gina Perry, and we put some reviews on the, the blackboard on the MOOC. Uh, Gina Perry reveals that there have been 24 different variations. Uh, Milgram himself, uh, in his book, only referred to 15 different variations. We will discuss this next week, and I hope that you also engage him in commenting this on, on the MOOC. Uh, but there were some variations, and I will tell you about a few in, in a moment. Originally, Milgram didn't think that too many people would obey. Pe Milgram asked experts, a couple of... Uh, other colleagues at Yale's, Yale University and other people he knew, other social psychologists, and this is a predicted line of obedience. So the experts thought that maybe about 90% of the participants would start with slight shocks of 50 to six, 15 to 60 per, um, volts. So the experts said, or thought, estimated, that originally at the very start of the experiment some 10% of the participants would refuse to give any shock. And then they expected a sharp decline and expected that only some 10% would continue until 195 to 240 volts and that obedience was zero from then on. And this is the actual response rate. So in the first version of the experiment, 100% of the participants continued, started with 15 to 16 volt, volts and continued to 195 to 240 volt. Then there was a decline, but over 60% went all the way through up until shock levels of 450 volts. 
In the initial study, the authority status and power was maximized. The experimenter was introduced as a respected scientist at Yale University. Then Milgram did several replications of the study in which the experimenter's authority was decreased. And he saw that the level of obedience also declined. So this was clear indication of it is a situation. It's not the people in the laboratory that are evil and that are looking forward to opportunities to be sadistic to others. It's a situation that can make a big difference. And obedience was reduced to 20% when the experimenter's ability to express his authority was limited by making him more distant from the teacher. So when the experimenter gave his commands over the telephone, and was sitting in another room. When the teacher gave the shock in the same room that the learner was in, and therefore the teacher could see the distress of the victim, obedience was also reduced, but again, was still 40% of the participants went to 450 volts. Yes, please. No. No, I, I don't think there's a single condition, even the, the conditions not reported um, in the original book where females have been studied. You may want to check this on, on, uh, uh, on YouTube or Google. Maybe there have been replications with females as well, but I'm not aware of any. Milgram studies also confirmed the role of unanimity. We will talk about unanimity later on when we talk about majority and minority influence in general. Uh, the important role of unanimity in conformity. When another research participant, who in fact was also a confederate of the experimenter, began by giving shocks, but then refused to continue to go on, and then the real experiment was asked to take over, only 10% were obedient. And if two experimenters were present in the room and only one proposed to continue shocking, while the other argued for stopping uh, the shocks, all of the research participants took the more benevolent advice and did not shock. So when the experimenters were in disagreement, obedience went down to zero. But zero or 10% or 40% always refers to the maximum shock level. It always refers to how, what was the proportion of participants and when to 450 volts. <coughs> Here are some of the experiments I told you about. Here in experiment 11, for example, the teacher could choose his own preferred shock level. So the experimenter told the teacher the, the procedure and said, and you can choose whatever level you want to choose and you can quit whenever you want. Still 2% of people uh, went to 450 volts. This was when two experimenters were present and one suggested not to shock. Then obedience was zero. And you see that was the original, very original uh, experiment with 65% of full obedience. And you have a variation from 20 to up to 50% in between. Um, I showed you, I also showed you this video because Gina Perry in her book makes very strong claims that Milgram's research was unethical in many ways and that we did therefore uh, should not have done these experiments in the first place but should also not continue with experiments like these in today's research. And um, I agree with, with some of her statements. I think it was definitely extremely unethical of Stanley Milgram that he didn't fully inform the participants of the real character of the experiment directly afterwards. For some participants, they lived their whole life thinking that they had done harm to another person. <laughs> Okay, and this is obviously not correct and today no experimenter would do this. But on the other hand, when someone is interested to buy this book, she's, she's a psychologist as well, but she's quite critical of studies like these and general psychological studies. And she herself uh, admits in the final uh, conclusion, in telling this story, I've probably been just as guilty of shaping, selecting, highlighting, and discounting things that don't fit the narrative that I'm trying to tell. 
Some might say I've worn my own set of blinkers. And I think this is true when, when, everyone, when anyone here wants to read the book, please be aware of that this is journalist style and she tells us a story and she leaves out some information that did not fit her story. She highlights information that fits her story well. But I'm not saying that uh, I'm, I'm not defending Milgram's research. It's a research classic. The original book, Authority to, uh, Obedience to Authority, is a very interesting read. The stories, the experiments were ver very cleverly designed. Um, and it's very good that we today have ethical standards that prevent us researchers from doing real harm to people. And to people, I mean the participants and not the confederates, of course. Would you think that if you would do a similar experiment today, that you would get the same results? How many think you would get the same result of 65% people obeying? OK, so it's, of course, very difficult to do an experiment like this, but it has been replicated some 10 years ago at an Australian university at La Trobe. <coughs> And they were very smart. First of all, they screened the participants very, very thoroughly. So they didn't admit any participant into the laboratory that had any problems, psychological or physical symptoms or something like this. So they very, very carefully screened the participants to make sure that they only got uh, emotionally stable people into the laboratory. Secondly, they fully debriefed the participants right after the experiment was over. But they also did one clever thing, and this was in the original variation. You see that when people shocked between 130, um, 180 volts, <laughs> these people who used this shock level continued all the way through. So they set up the experiment in the exact same way, only that the shock generator stopped at 240 volts. And they knew from the original experiment that there was a high likelihood that if people didn't stop anywhere here, they would have gone all the way through if the shock generator was providing more options. So their level of obedience stopped here, but they again saw some 60 to 65 percent of full obedience. So even in 2002, even in a relatively easygoing, tolerant society or culture like Australia, you would get the same level of obedience. People blindly following commands, given the right circumstances, even when they knew that they were doing harm to another living being. Okay? Maybe as an aside, this morning I read in the, in, in the Spiegel online uh, research by a famous uh, professor in the economics department at Cologne Univer at Bonn University, Armin Falk. Uh, he is doing um, economic studies during, using experiments like we do. This is called behavioral economics. And he is doing very clever experiments. One experiment he did in a classroom of his uh, economic students was he showed them a video of a mouse uh, dying from some gas. So the mouse being put in a, in a cage and some gas went into that cage and after a few minutes the mouse was dead. So he was asking his <coughs> students individually, I have a couple of more mice, would you be willing to kill the mice if yes, you earn 10 euro. And the mice were really, for every participant who took the 10 euro, the mice were really put to death. So it was a real experiment. Nothing like we psychologists normally do, pretending that we have some mice in, in, in the next room, and in fact there aren't. Uh, real mice that were really killed if you, were take, if, if you took the 10 euros. How many of you would take the 10 euros? Honestly, come on. No one? 10 euros is a lot of money. It's just a small mouse. <laughs> I 
In Falk's experiment, 40% of the students took the 10 euro and I don't know how many hundred mice were killed afterwards. 40% of students took the 10 euros. Read this in the Spiegel online. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting, it's today Deutschland's uh, beste Professor in, in Spiegel online today. It's a very interesting uh, uh, small uh, uh, account of, of Armin Falk's work and what he wants to show with, with his work. Um, um das aufzuklären, die Mäuse wurden wirklich getötet, aber die Mäuse wären auch sonst getötet worden. Was Falk gemacht hat, war, er hat mit, dem, mit, mit dem, der, dem Labor oder so, wo die Mäuse normalerweise getötet worden wären, ausgehandelt, dass für jede Maus, die, die seine Studenten nicht töten würden, also 60 Prozent, wird eine Maus aus dem Labor, die normalerweise sowieso getötet worden wäre, gerettet und kann bis zum Lebensende glücklich vor sich hin leben, bekommt Futter, bekommt, wenn es krank wird, einen Tierarzt zu sehen. Das heißt, in Wirklichkeit, aber das hat er so natürlich nicht, nicht sagen können, in Wirklichkeit hat sein Versuch sozusagen insgesamt dazu beigetragen, dass mehr Mäuse gerettet worden sind, als wenn er diesen Versuch nicht gemacht hätte. Was natürlich dann irgendwie wieder, wieder ganz schön ist. Aber ich finde es äußerst überraschend, dass 40 Prozent der Studenten, nachdem sie einen Film gesehen haben, in, der man, in dem man sieht, wie so eine kleine Maus qualvoll stirbt, dass 40 Prozent der Studenten sich dann dafür entscheiden, lieber die 10 Euro zu nehmen, als die Maus leben zu lassen. Ähm, und ich glaube, wir würden hier auch 40 Prozent finden, wenn man die Prozedur entsprechend genauso gestaltet wie wie Armin Falk das gemacht hat. Ich glaube nicht, dass die Bonner Wirtschaftswissenschaften Studenten per se schlechter sind als Frankfurter Psychologiestudierende. Ich glaube, das ist eben das, was wir in der Welt sehen. Der Markt entscheidet und für manche Leute sind 10 Euro mehr wert als das Leben einer kleinen Maus. Und ob das jetzt 30, 40 oder 50 Prozent sind, ist relativ egal. Lesen Sie den Artikel mal durch, da werden noch andere interessante Follow-up-Studien beschrieben. Um, okay. Yes, please. No, I don't think so. It, it was different from just a question and then giving 10 euro notes to everyone. I think it was a private, anonymous decision. Okay, now to the general research on conformity and then majority and minority influence. Group norms, the norms in the groups we are members of are enormously potent sources of conformity. Typically, we all tend to yield to the majority. It simply feels awkward to disagree. When we are a member of the group and the majority of the group wants X, then it doesn't feel good to say or do Y. Typically, we yield to the majority influence. Uh, yes. I thought about uh, would be interesting to do the same experience, not with students, but with members of an annual protection group or something like this. <laughs> probably, uh, <laughs> probably they would kill the experimenter. <laughs> but. Conformity can be reduced if the task is, task is unambiguous and people are not under surveillance, though even under these circumstances there is often some residual conformity. Lack of unanimity among the majority is particularly effective in reducing conformity. People may also conform in order to feel sure about the objective validity of their perceptions and opinions, to, approve, to, to obtain social approval, to avoid social disapproval, or to express or validate their social identity as members of a specific group. Now, how was this studied? How can we study whether group norms are potent, uh, whether conformity is reduced by unanimity, uh, that people conform simply to validate their social identity, etc. And I will show you some classic experiment. The first experiment was done by Mustafa Sharif. Sharif was a Turkish uh, 
was a social psychologist in the US with Turkish origin. We will talk about Sharif in two weeks' time because he also did the classic uh, uh, summer camp studies on prejudice and intergroup uh, hostility. In 1936, he did an experiment when, where he got participants in the, into the laboratory and either alone or in groups of three, they were in a completely dark room, no light. There was a small light put on about two meters away from them. And because our involuntary eye movements, our eyes involuntary without us knowing or uh, consciously making our eyes to do so, involuntary our eyes slightly move and in a completely otherwise dark room this small light seems to move as well because of our eye mov movements. The question is how far does the light move? We don't have any objective standard that we can use. And when asked by the experimenter, how far do you think the light moves? In the first original condition, when three individuals are sitting in, a, in, a, in this room alone, you see that their estimates are quite heterogeneous. So the, this participant, the yellow participant, only thought it was one or two inches, so a couple of centimeters. Uh, the blue participant said, oh, it's a little bit more, it's up to three or two and a half inches. The first participant thought, oh, it's almost nine inches, 27 centimeters or so. So they were quite heterogeneous. Afterwards, they were sit in the same room, facing the same light source as a group of three individuals, and when one individual starts, you see that the other already start becoming more narrow in the extremes. And after three or four trials, you see that they converge on a group norm. This seems to be something we all want to do. If we are among others, then we want to think like the others do. And if we are unsure if the, the, the stimulus is very ambiguous, we simply don't know whether it's five or 50 centimeters we more agree to what the other people convey uh, the movement is. In the next phase of the experiment, he did the opposite. So he asked people in a group to start with the experiment. You think that in the very first attempt, there's also some variation, a little smaller than here, but there's also some variation. Again, like here, the group quickly conveys to a group norm. And this group norm continues to be salient even in the final stage where the three participants were isolated again and did the final uh, phase uh, themselves. So the group norm was internalized and people really thought that the, the uh, light source was moving like six and a half inches, although if they were put in front of the same light, they were quite, there was quite m large variation in their, in their attitudes, okay? This was how we could study whether group norms emerge or not. Deutsch and Gerard wanted to know whether there's a difference in whether the task is ambiguous or not. And what they presented is lengths of its lines, and participants had to estimate the lengths. And in the low uncertainty condition, the, the lines were present all the time, so it was not ambiguous. You could see the light. In the high uncertainty condition, the li line was briefly showed and then removed. So there was more ambiguity. And Deutsch and Gerard did this in three different uh, conditions. In the first condition, they were sitting in one room so they could, could see each other. And there was a group goal. The experimenter said that you are a group of three people and we want you to agree on the length of line. Uh, in the second condition, there was face-to-face -face, uh, experiments. So the participants did see each other, but there was no group, group goal included. And in the final condition, in the third condition, the uh, estimates would be made privately and anonymous. And you see this is a percentage of socially induced errors. So how many participants 
under or overestimate the lengths of lines because of the other participants. And you see when there was face-to-face -face and a group goal, there were more socially induced errors than in the just face-to-face -face condition or in the private and anonymous condition. And you can also see when there is low uncertainty, when the stimulus is present all the time, there is socially induced errors only if there is face-to-face interaction and a group go to agree. And it's sharply declined in the face-to-face -face condition and there are almost no errors in the private or an anonymous condition. When the stimulus is uncertain, when it's absent, then the errors are much higher. Yes, please. Um, this was a standard line and you should estimate which of the comparison line was the correct one and in the private and, and in, in say in the face to face condition we were sitting there with three people and he was estimating A, she was estimating A and then my task was to estimate B or saying also A and that would be a socially induced error and in the face-to-face -face condition both with and without group goal this would have to, make, to be um, um, made public so I had to call A, B or C in the private and anonymous condition I just had to write it down without the other seeing me okay I asked you uh, whether men or women would be more likely to uh, be persuaded and uh, to follow requests. All the initial research up until, I don't know, the 1960s or 70s showed that women were more easily persuaded. And then some researchers started thinking about might that be the case because all the experimenters are male all the researchers are male and maybe therefore also the topics that experimenters used in their research are somewhat male dominated topics and uh, Sistrung and McDavid uh, therefore conducted an experiment where they varied the topic and it was either some gender neutral thing or something where men typically have a little bit more expertise like techniques, cars, etc., or things where females have a little bit more expertise, household items, etc. This was in 1971, so the experiment was done in 1969-70. And you see, in the neutral condition, there was almost no change or, or no difference between men and women. This was not significant. So uh, the percentage of people conforming with the request were about 40% in both sexes. Uh, for masculine dominated uh, items, women conform much more than men, but the opposite was true for feminine dominated items. So it really depends on what we are talking about. It really depends on whether the person we try to influence correctly or incorrectly believes that he or she has expertise and have the ability to process information in an elaborated way or not. And apparently when we talk about things where uh, female participants have more knowledge about than male participants uh, are much more likely to conform than females, but the opposite is true for masculine items. So when, when you come across statements, generalized statements in, in newspapers or so that women are more easily influenced, you should always ask yourself who was the experimenter or who was the, the source of the message and what was the message's content because as you can see it does vary quite uh, substantially. Okay, and now majority and minority influence. And for majority influence, the classic researcher that you should all know is Solomon Ash. Solomon Ash in the 1950s did his famous studies. He invited a number of uh, participants to the laboratory. He seated uh, the participants around a table. And the trick was that there was only one real participant. 
All the others were confederates of the experimenter. Now imagine you just came into the laboratory and you were taking some lots from, 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 a, um, yeah, from a lottery and you were given position number six in this seating assignment. Number one, two, three, four, five, and seven are all confederates of the experimenter. But that you don't know. You think it's real participants like you. And you can see in this young man's face, he's really concerned about his perception, his eyesight, his, the quality of his uh, thoughts. Because the five participants in front of him all gave an incorrect answer. So put yourself in the shoes of these participants. What would you think? You, you are given this task, you are shown one standard line, and then you have to decide which one of the comparison lines match the standard line. It's very easy, very simple. It's all there. And when alone, almost no errors occur. So everyone got this one right. But now put yourself in the shoes of this young man. What would you say, or what would you think, and then say, if five participants in front of you would all say, um, sorry, line A is correct. You would probably be hesitant, because there would be two motives. One motive would be to be correct and to name the right line. The other motive would be you don't want to be socially disapproved by the others. You don't want to be excluded. You want to feel part of the, the group. If the others in the group gave the same wrong answer before the participants turn, then sometimes the participants repeated this incorrect answer. And 76% of the 123 men in the original experiment gave at least one incorrect response. And this is evidence for the power of social conformity. No ambiguity in the stimuli whatsoever. No pressure whatsoever. No financial reward or anything if we reveal the right or the wrong answer. Just the sheer fact that few participants in front of the real participants gave the wrong answer also made 76% of the participants giving an incorrect answer themselves at least once. Conformity was not absolute. Obviously, 24% of the participants did never give the wrong answer, but st stuck to their uh, true feelings or true attitudes. And only 5% of the men conformed on all 12 of the critical trials. So conformity was not absolute, but there is evidence for the power of social conformity, even in, in such an experiment where there's no pressure and clear, unambiguous stimuli. And as I said, a basic assumption of group dynamics is that there's a general pressure towards similarity in groups. And conformity is more likely in some groups than in others. And the social factors that produce conformity are well known. Yes, please. Not. Sorry. I don't know. I, um, and as far as I know, uh, Solomon Esch did not do any personality tests or additional tests that could give us an idea. So she's asking why are 24% never conforming to the majority? And I don't know, and I think in Solomon Esch studies this, this hasn't been the focus of attention. Solomon Esch just wanted to show that uh, people convey or conform to the majority's views by setting up this experiment. Obviously, there will be some inter-individual differences. So one factor that we discuss when we talk about prejudice is authoritarianism. Some people, by 
nature are more likely to conform to authorities and others are more likely to withstand obeys by authorities. And this obviously will have played a role here, but this hasn't been researched by Solomon Ash in this experiment. Um, so Solomon Ash, for example, varied the number of confederates from 1 to 16. And he found that the bigger the majority, the more likely it was that the only participant gave the incorrect answer. But increasing the size of the majority only increases conformity up to a point. This is called social impact. Social impact is the increase in the amount of conformity that is produced by each new member that you add to the group. And it's greater for the initial majority than for members who join the group later. This was shown in an experiment by Milgram who studied the number of people gawking on a city street increases the number of people who also stop to gawk themselves. Gawking means staring into the sky. We did an experiment like this in the city of Mainz a couple of years ago. So we had a few students who started gawking into the sky and we filmed and counted the people, passers-by, um, who also stopped and started uh, staring into the sky. And as Milgram and, and colleagues showed, uh, obviously, when there is no one, then no one is gawking. Okay. When there is one participant or two participants, 40% of passers-by also stop and start looking up. When there are three participants, it increases to 60% or almost 60%. So you see the impact of the additional first, second, third person is quite large. When you add more people, like the fourth, the fifth, the sixth one, you see that the impact is declining. So yes, adding members to the majority does increase the impact on others, but after you've added a few more people, the impact of each additional confederate was less than for the previous one. As the number in the group increases, the individuals in the majority quickly come to be seen as a group rather than individuals. So here, if you see two people gawking into the sky and a third person is added, then this makes one, one and another one. If the fourth person is added, then you may still be able to count four individuals. And four individuals obviously have a higher impact than just two individuals. When you have too many people, however, when you have six, seven, or eight, you don't see them as six, seven, or eight individuals. But from a certain point onwards, you start the individuals seeing as one group. And it doesn't make a difference anymore whether the group comprises five, six, or eight people. And another reason is predicted by the principle of optimal distinctiveness. When there are a lot of people in the majority, individuals feel the need to maintain their individual identity by not conforming. Uh, Marilyn Brewer has developed this principle of optimal distinctiveness. She suggested that we humans are always feel the tension between two main motives. One motive is we want to belong to others, and the other motive, particularly in individualistic societies like ours or the U US American, is we want to stand out with our individual strengths and weaknesses. So we prefer small groups, and particularly we want to prefer being members of small groups because it satisfied our need to belong and also allow some individuality. When we are a member of groups that have hundreds or thousands of members, our need for belongingness is satisfied, but we can hardly satisfy the other need. Yeah. yeah. It, it could be seen as leadership. Um, there's a very interesting video on YouTube uh, about leadership and followership. It's someone in a, in a public park starting to dance. 
and then slowly more and more people join this person and eventually almost everyone is dancing in, in this park. And the authors of this video make the, make the point, and I think this is relevant here as well, it's not necessarily the leader, it's the first follower who is critical. If one person is dancing around in a public park and there wasn't a single follower, then this leader would not have any impact. It's the first one who joins the leader and then it's already a group and when the third and fourth one joins then it's a pack and then everyone else joins in. Um, it's also important that the majority members are unanimous. So in Ash study conformity occurred not just because Confederates gave a wrong answer but because each of the Confederates gave the same wrong answer. And in other variations, Ash increased the number of Confederates, but one of those Confederates gave the correct answer, and he found that conformity was sharply reduced to only 5%. So from 76% to 5%, when one of the Confederates gave the correct answer, even if there were 15 others who gave an incorrect answer. And this also occurred when the dissenting confederate gave a different but also a wrong answer. So when 15 confederates said the wrong line A would be correct and one confederate would say the wrong line C is correct, this encourages the participant to name the, wrong, the, the correct line B. Why is that the case? Why is unanimity so important? Why is conformity reduced to only a few percent or sometimes zero when there is no consent, uh, consistency across uh, majority? First, when there is complete agreement among the majority members, the individual who is target of the influence stands alone. He must be the first to break ranks by giving a different opinion. And this is embarrassing. We don't like it. When five or six or eight participants in front of us have given the wrong answer, it's embarrassing. It doesn't feel good to be the first who breaks ranks. When there's complete agreement, the participant may also become less sure of his or her conflicting judgment. So we really think about why do they say this? Maybe I'm looking at it from the wrong angle or maybe I haven't understood the instructions. So we really become unsure when there's complete agreement. When one or more of the other group members gives a different answer from the rest of the group, that person changes from being part of the majority group to now being part of, together with the real participant, a group of minority uh, participants. And as soon as the individual has someone who agrees with him or her, they no longer need to conform. Having one or more supporters who challenge the status quo validates one's own opinion and makes disagreeing with the majority less fearful or stressful. Okay, now you can ask, and some critics have done this, you can ask, yeah, but it's also arbitrary, it's some lines, there's no real money involved, it's so, so ridiculous in a way. Um, but the studies of Sharif or Ash were very important to establish that there is majority influence in the first place, that people conform to group norms in the first place. But then there were some experiments that tested whether conformity would be higher or lower when the task was important or when the participants felt responsible for their decision. And one study was done by Baron Vandello and Brunsman. Uh, they asked people to identify uh, individuals out of a lineup. So this picture was shown, and then this picture was shown, and the uh, correct number would have been uh, this participant was the target or the reference. And Baron and colleagues manipulated two things. In the task high importance condition, they said, 
We are researchers that work with the uh, local court and we are about to study uh, the correctness of eyewitnesses and our research is very important because our results will help training eyewitnesses in the future trial. And if you get most of the responses correct, you would get an, a $20 extra reward which is a little bit of a problem. We don't know which of these variables influence the outcomes. There's a conflation here, but you would agree that both together make this condition more important than a condition without any financial reward, and it was introduced just as, just, this is just a pilot test. We are doing some research in the future, and here's a pilot test. We don't know yet uh, where it leads us to, but it's important that you participate. Obviously, this condition is of lower importance than this condition. And they manipulate the task difficulty. In the task low, con low difficulty or in the easy condition, they showed the reference line, the reference picture for 5 to 10 seconds. In the high difficulty condition, they only showed the pictures uh, from between half a second to one second and then removed them. Okay? Difficulty high, low, importance high, low. And this is the result. When task difficulty was easy, participants, this is the number of errors which is conformity. So the basic setup was similar to Ash. There were a couple of confederates who all gave the wrong answer, who identified the wrong person out of the lineup. And the higher the bars, the more, the more did the real participant conform to the majority's wrong answer. And you see, when the task was easy, was simple, you could see who was the right person. People followed the majority when it was low of importance, when no individual gain was involved, and when the study as such was not considered so important. When the study was considered important, very few errors were made. So majority influence was greatest when the task was easy and it was of low importance. And it was the opposite when the task was difficult. Because the difficulty, you only very briefly see the pictures and then you have to make a quick decision. Is it person A, B, C or D? And here you conform to the majority the more important you thought this task was because here you were really a little bit unsure about the correct answer because it was so brief, and then you yielded to the majority. When you found the task of low importance, however, you stuck to your own opinion and revealed that because you thought it doesn't matter anyway, so I can just give the right answer. Okay? So task difficulty and task importance do matter. Now we have 10 minutes left for minority influence and it's not because I consider minority influence less important. It, it's only that we have to understand all this research on obedience and majority influence in the first place. Historically, social psychology started with social influence from the majority's perspective and I also think that majority influence is probably in most of our decisions that we take day in and day out, the more likely influence or the predominant influence in terms of time we spend with these things, etc. The person who started working on minority influence was Serge Moscovici, a researcher from uh, France, and he said, okay, I believe in this majority influence research, and yes, I, I do think that these studies are convincing, showing that 50, 70, sometimes more percent of the participants do agree to the majority. But first of all, we also see that sometimes, um, sometimes people do not conform. 5% in the ASH studies, 30% in Milgram studies, etc. And Look around you. Where does social change happen? Social change happens when minorities start taking action. 
Most of you are too young to remember the good old times uh, in the 1960s when I was fighting on the streets of Frankfurt together with Joschka Fischer and, and all the other pals uh, when we changed the world. Most of you weren't around when I was with Joschka Fischer in the plenary, style, uh, plenary house of, of the uh, Hessian parliament when he was sworn in to become the first minister uh, wearing trainers. Um, most of you were not around when me and my female friends fought for the rights of women in Germany, when we fought for them being able to play football. <laughs> You know that this only has been uh, allowed in the late 1970s. Up until then, according to the rules of the German, Do German <coughs> Deutschen Fußballbund, women were not allowed to play football. Up until the late 1960s, women were not allowed to take an occupation, to take a job, without the official agreement of their husbands. And this is minority influence, females, uh, student revolution, the uh, civil rights movements, claiming more rights for black people in the United States. These are all accounts and, and good examples for minorities who also can be influential. According to the classic view, only majority was influential, and according to social impact, Majorities were more influential the more majority people there were, and minority influence was considered very unlikely. And then Serge Moscovici said that although conformity to a majority opinions is essential to provide a smooth working society, we need conformity. Our societies wouldn't work if there was complete disagreement, if students in a classroom would always argue with the teachers, if workers would always argue the opposite than managers would do. We would not have a smooth working society. But if individuals would only conform to others, there would never be any social change or innovation. So sometimes we need minority members who try to advance our theory, advance public life. And the first experiment that Moscovici did with uh, Lars and Nafrajeu is uh, they created the reverse of the Ash experiment. So they invited real participants into the laboratory, but this time the Confederates were in the minority. So there were, I don't know, say six real participants and only three people who were Confederates and who argued uh, as a minority. He didn't use uh, lines. He used uh, slides of blue pictures, just blue, nothing else than blue in varying intensities. And he asked, which color do you see? And the Confederates, the two or three minority Confederates, always said green. The Confederates called the slide green on only 25% of their responses, called them blue on the, blue on the other 75 uh, percent of the respondent in the inconsistent condition. In the consistent condition, they call the slide green every time. What you see is in a control condition without any minority, there were almost no errors. Almost no one called the D as, as a slide uh, green. Everyone said blue. When the minority was inconsistent, there was no significant difference, no impact. When the minority was consistent, however, you see that almost 9% of the participants gave the wrong answer. Although the slides were clearly blue, also a minority of two, student, two uh, members saying they were green made a difference and made the real participants say green uh, in these trials. Now, is it one process or several? Uh, two. Uh, for parsimonious, we could say, okay, minority members do have some influence according to this formula. So the influence is defined by the function of strength of the majority, immediacy of the, uh, the or closeness to the participant, and the number. 
And when strength and immediacy are the same, then just the number influences or decides on the influence we get. And when we only have two minority members, then the influence would be lower than when we have three minority members, when we have four minority members, or when we have five people who start being the majority. But it's just one process. And the more people you add, the more influence you have. And if it wasn't a minority, but a majority arguing for the same thing, they would have more impact. Moscovici said, uh, this is not true. He argued that there were substantial and important differences between majority and minority influence. When the message comes from the majority, it's easily accepted as being valid, simply because so many people think so or say so. When the minority, however, tries to influence us, it makes us think about the arguments. It makes us think about the material. It makes us changing our opinion because we truly feel that this is correct. And he called this a dual process approach, and yet you can compare it with the ELM, the elaboration likelihood model, when there's a majority, we just go the peripheral route. The Q is the number of people. And if everyone agrees, then it must be true. We don't process the arguments, we just agree. But what we probably do is we just say we agree, and we probably don't change our opinion in a long-lasting way, and we probably don't change our behavior. When the minority is trying to influence us, however, it's more that we go the central route when we are motivated and able, at least. Then we process the information we receive from the minority because the minority as such is not providing us with a salient cue that follows the peripheral route. Okay, and I'm just showing you the, uh, the experiments that show that this might be true. One experiment was conducted by Anamas and Clark uh, in 1983. They asked people whether they are pro or gay, pro or anti-gay rights. You see, the higher the number of these uh, axes is, the more anti-gay the participants said they were. They were faced with a majority and a minority that was arguing either anti-majority and pro-gay rights minority or the opposite, the majority was ar arguing pro-gay rights and the minority arguing anti-gay rights, and in a control group no influence was exceeded. The blue line is those participants who had to give their opinion privately on a piece of paper, on a questionnaire that was anonymous, that was kept anonymous. Those in the red condition had to publicly reveal their attitudes you see that in the control group there is small variation. So almost the same number of somewhere in between pro and anti-gay rights. This was in the early 80s. When the majority was anti-gay rights, you see that people publicly were also more into the direction anti-gay rights, but they privately were more, more pro-gay rights. When the majority was pro-gay rights and the minority was anti, the pattern reversed. So you see that from the majority, pro or anti, we do get influence, but only in our public attitudes. So compared to the control group, people who are faced a majority more anti are also slightly going more anti in their public opinion. They are much more going pro in their public opinion, but privately people are influenced more by the minority than by the majority. And this is a classic experiment by Moscovici and Personas. They also used a very clever setup. They showed people again the green, the, the, the blue slide. And in phase one, there was no influence. In phase two, a confederate was present. In phase three, the confederate was absent again. And either this confederate was introduced as someone representing the majority opinion, 
or the minority opinion. So this confederate was introduced as someone who was of very good eyesight and extremely well tested and uh, his data shows that his eyesight is representing about 80% of the general population. In the minority view or minority condition, the same confederate was introduced as someone who recently had some problems with his eyesight and, and his answers may not always be correct. Now, the Confederate said green in, in, in all conditions. And the real participant was not asked, which color do you see? But the slide was removed, and the participant was asked, which after image do you now see on the wall? And when the after image was yellow, then the real participant still had thought and seen the slide as blue. When the after image was, after image was purple, the participant would have truly seen the slide as green and not blue. The slides were always blue. And we don't know which after images we see normally. We don't, when, when I would ask you quickly which after image would the color red reveal, you would have to think about it. We, 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 don't, uh, we are not experts on after images. So participants were asked quickly, what color do you see now? And either they said yellow or they said purple. Um, and you see, before there was any influence, participants on average perceived the after image more as yellow than purple, which is they all saw the slides as blue, which they were. When the confederate was present, and was part of the majority, people said yellow. When this confederate was part of the minority, they said purple. Because the minority made the participants really think about, why is he saying green? It looks blue. Hmm, I look closer. Maybe it's a little bit blue green. And this made them developing the after image of purple. And this even um, maintain, they maintained the attitude when the confederate was absent in the next phase of the experiment. So when the confederate was a majority member, we don't change our after image. We say, okay, the slide is blue, but we are not thinking about it, and we give the same after image. Oh, sorry. When, when it was, sorry. When it was a majority, and the majority confederate said the slide is green, we say, yes, it's green. But when we are asked about the after image, we still see the after image of blue because we haven't changed our real attitude. When the participant was introduced as a minority member, we may or may not say green publicly, but we do change our attitudes and we really start seeing the slide as being green. And this is an indication that there are really two processes that it's not only the number of participants in the majority versus the minority condition, but it's really a difference between how we process the information from majority to minority. I thank you very much and see you next week.